Hey everyone, I hope you're doing well. Today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about chemical bonds. What is a chemical bond? Well, um, unfortunately, answering this question adequately would require me to shove way more content than I'm willing to into a single video, let alone a single definition. But I guess if I had to define a chemical bond, a very, very basic definition, I would say that a chemical bond is a strong attraction between atoms. And I don't know about you, but with me, sometimes when I'm studying certain topics and I, take, I start to take a closer look at things and things become more complicated, more difficult, more complex, at times it is easy for me to forget about the basic fundamental laws and principles that govern the behavior that I'm studying. And so that's really the purpose of this video is to talk about the basic laws and principles that, uh, that govern the behavior that we call chemical bonding. So if you're new to chemical bonding, if you don't know much about it, or if you're just so deep into the knowledge that you've forgotten about the basics, then I think this video will be helpful and I hope you stick around. So by now I'm sure you're aware that there exist these things called atoms. And they are the basic building blocks of matter. And a little over a century ago it was discovered that atoms are actually composed of smaller units called subatomic particles, of which there are three main types, protons, neutrons, and, <clears throat> and electrons, which are positively charged, uh, neutral, and negatively charged, respectively. And I'm sure you're probably also aware that the atom is structured such that the protons and neutrons are located in a very small but very dense region in the center of the atom called the nucleus, and that the rest of the space around the atom, which is the overwhelming majority of the atom's volume, is taken up by the negatively charged electron cloud. And I say cloud because, well, the best description of an electron is a region of space in which you are likely to find the electron. So I know we've all seen that model where the electrons are orbiting the nucleus in a way that, that planets orbit the sun or something like that, but this is actually incorrect, highly incorrect uh, in describing actual electron behavior. Why? Well, because even though electrons do behave like particles in the sense that they have a definite charge and a definite, ma a definite mass and all that kind of stuff, uh, they also behave a lot like waves. And as a result of electrons behaving as waves, we get this thing called the uncertainty principle, under which the more you know about the electron's position, the less you know about its energy. And in general, scientists would much rather know the energies of electrons accurately while knowing their positions much less accurately. It's much more useful to do it that way than the other way around. So. In the context of chemical bonding, you know, if we're asking ourselves what is the origin, what is the nature of chemical bonding, well, it all comes from interactions between the charged particles within atoms. Interactions between electrons, interactions between protons, and interactions between electrons and protons, right? <coughs> Excuse me. So let's talk a little bit about why chemical bonds form. Why would two atoms form an attraction between them. What's to be gained by doing that? Why does it happen? Well, anytime you want to answer a question that begins with the word why, you're almost always going to be talking about energy, thermodynamics. And so let's talk about that a little bit. So what's particularly important in the context of chemical bonding is the concept of potential energy. So remember, potential energy, we're kind of going way back here, but potential energy is the energy that an object has due to its position or its composition, right? So for instance, if I have this phone here and I'm holding it way high up, it has quite a bit of potential energy due to its position within Earth's gravitational field. So very, very important to understand that chemical and physical systems, whenever they can, they will always change in a way that minimizes their potential energy. Very, very important. Let me say that once again. Chemical and physical systems, whenever they can, they will act in a way that lowers their potential energy. So if we go back to the phone again, if I'm holding the phone up high, it has a lot of potential energy. Whenever I remove the barrier that is holding it up, it falls down and it achieves a lower potential energy state. So we need to understand and accept that basic principle. If we don't accept that principle, if we reject that idea that systems act in a way that minimizes their potential energy, 
then we're not going to be able to understand chemical bonding or science in general for that matter. So if you don't mind, I'd like to just accept that basic principle that nature tends toward lowest potential energy and move on. Because if we want to try to challenge that principle or question it, then the answer is going to be very, very complicated and uh, certainly beyond the scope of this discussion. So, well, you know, we're just going to accept it and move on. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to do that in, in science. Um, all right. So, what are the, uh, what's a way that we can sort of describe the potential energy associated with interactions between charged particles of atoms? Well, one equation that is going to come in handy is the Coulomb's law equation, which describes the potential energy of a system composed of two charged particles. And it looks like this, where you've got E equals 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 times Q1, Q2 over R. Now that, uh, ep that the E, let's start with that, the E is the potential energy of that system. The epsilon 0 is called the permittivity of free space, and you don't really need to know much about that other than that it's a positive constant. It does have a numerical value, but for this discussion it's not important. Just remember that it is a positive constant. It's positive and it does not change. And then Q1 and Q2, those are the charges of the two particles. So they can be big or small, positive or negative. And then R is the distance that separates the particles. So this equation might look a little uh, complicated, but it gets much more simple um, when we realize that that whole term, that 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 term, is a positive constant. Because, well, since epsilon 0 is a positive constant, and pi is also a positive constant, right? And you know, 3.14, blah, 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 blah. Since those two are positive content, uh, constants, this whole term is a positive constant. And so it doesn't really have much of an impact on the equation. The real source of variability in this equation is the other term, the Q1, Q2 over R. So let's talk about that for a moment. So notice that if Q1 and Q2 are the same sign, if they're both positive or if they're both negative, then the potential energy, E, is going to be positive, which means that it's generally an unfavorable, repulsive interaction. You have like charges repelling one another, and that's a high, uh, high potential energy situation, or positive potential energy uh, situation. On the flip side, if Q1 and Q2 are opposite signs, if one's positive and one's negative, well, then that flips the sign of your potential energy. Potential energy becomes negative at that point. And that means that you have an attractive interaction, an attractive force between the two particles. And then if we take a look at R, I mean, we can see that R is in the diameter of this fraction. So that means a couple of things. First of all, r can't be zero because you can't have zero in the denominator. The function would be undefined at zero. And then as r increases, the, as the distance between the particles increases, the potential energy gets smaller, which makes sense, right? If you increase the denominator of a fraction, then the overall fraction gets smaller. And it also makes sense from a theoretical standpoint, too. Like as the particles become further and further apart, they have less and less of an impact on each other. They feel the, you know, the charged particles are feeling each other. <laughs> that kind of sounds weird, but they, uh, they have less uh, force on each other, less of an impact on it. You know what I'm saying. Anyway, <laughs> so that's Coulomb's law. It's very useful for describing potential energy of a two charged particle system, um, but atoms are a little bit more complicated, right? Because they have more than one type of charged particle. They have protons and they have electrons, right? So with atoms, there's really three possibilities, right? So you have repulsions between electrons of two atoms. So we, again, each atom is going to have its own electron cloud and its own nucleus. So you're going to have repulsions between the electron clouds of those two atoms. You're also going to have repulsions between the nuclei of those two atoms. And then you're also going to have attractions, attractions between the electrons of one atom and the nuclei of uh, the nucleus of another, right? So when it comes to chemical bonds and you're trying to figure out, you know, will a chemical bond form, will an attraction form between two atoms? Well, it depends largely on the distance between the atoms, right? Because at some distances, if the atoms are really close together, then the positively charged nuclei are going to repel one another and the atoms would rather be further apart and 
but if the atoms are too far apart, then that means that, well, the, 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 the atoms no longer really have an influence on one another. They're not feeling each other at that point in time. And so graphically, we can, uh, we can look at it like this. And this is kind of what it looks like for um, a system where you have two atoms. Uh, you're looking at, at a function of, uh, you're looking at potential energy as a function of the distance between the atoms. So on the y-axis, that's potential energy. And on the x-axis, that's the um, distance between the atoms, right? So notice that if we start with zero, zero distance between the atoms, and we just go outward, keep going further and further apart, well, at zero, for reasons that we discussed before, the function is going to be undefined because the atoms can't exist in the exact same space. But once you go slightly above zero, you can see that the potential energy is very, very high. And the reason why is because the, the repulsive forces of the protons, the nuclei of those two atoms, are the dominant forces. Those are the strongest forces in that system. And so that's a high potential, potential energy situation. The atoms, you can think of it like the atoms would much rather be farther apart from one another. And so initially, initially, we start to get a downward climb in the potential energy as the, as the atoms become further apart. And then notice that at, at a certain point, we reach a valley in this graph. We, we, we reach a local minimum in this graph in potential energy. And this minimum is like what I call the sweet spot, right? So that, that's the distance between the atoms where the most favorable interactions are taking place. The attractive forces between the electron cloud of one atom and the nucleus of another, that force is the dominant force. So the, uh, the decrease in potential energy due to those forces is dominating over any kind of repulsive forces between the two electron clouds or between the two uh, nuclei. And so after you reach that minimum, the potential energy starts to climb upward again, and it approaches zero because as the atoms get further and further apart, they have, they're feeling each other less, and they have less of an impact on one another. And it just approaches zero, but mathematically never quite reaches zero. So there you have it. So that is uh, just, again, some of the basic laws and principles that govern chemical bonding. I am working on uh, some content right now. I'm going to get into great detail um, with these various different uh, chemical bonding theories. And we're going to talk about like molecular shapes and valence bond theory and molecular orbit orbital theory and all that kind of stuff. And I do have some old videos on these topics back when I used to do my old school whiteboard style of, uh, of lecturing in these videos. So if you want to check those out, feel free to check those out. Um, but there's lots of more new content on the way. But always keep in mind that all of these different chemical bonding theories that you may have heard of or that we're going to talk about in the future are all manifestations of these basic laws and principles. Coulomb's law and that overall uh, principle with potential energy that um, nature tends to proceed toward a minimum potential energy. So that is all for right now. I hope you found this video helpful and I look forward to seeing you next time. All right, thanks. Have a good one.